Well, uh, welcome back to the Friday Night Armistice. It's the week that uh, Education Secretary David Blunkett announced children will be taught more maths and less history and technology so that in a few years' time they'll be able to calculate exactly how much one Millennium Dome costs, <laughs> but not whether it's the crappiest thing ever made. <laughs> It was, uh, it was also the week that Japan, at last, apologised to the British for Tamagotchi cyber pets. <laughs> and meanwhile, it was uh, a bad week for the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, Britain's own Tamagotchi. Uh, <laughs> So-called because he's probably only got about nine days left. <laughs> uh, now, Robin Cook spent the week denying rumours that he'd had many affairs in the past, although, as these pictures from Cherry Blair's home video collection <laughs> shows, the seeds for Robin Cook's downfall may have been sown many years ago. <laughs> Moving now from Robin Cook to foxes, the second best form of frightened ginger mammal. <laughs> the, government, the government are still not going to ban fox hunting, but to placate certain pressure groups, they have announced plans to allow the hunting of known paedophiles. <laughs> there he goes. and parents will be allowed to send a pack of baying dogs after these pests and drive them back into their pebble-dashed burrows. <laughs> and finally, as ITV announces plans to woo away BBC stars, the BBC retaliates by launching Carol Vorderman Gold, the final <laughs> stage, the final stage of its plan to turn BBC One into a rolling Vorderman channel. <laughs> Welcome to another terrible Carol Vorderman programme. <laughs> Woman, every week, 250,000 controversial Carol Vorderman series oh. heading your way. So, get me banned because I get on your tits. So, <laughs> <laughs> Robin Cook business. I mean, it really does go to the heart of government, I think. Mm. I mean, he's been all over the place. We've got some more damning evidence here. Uh, look at this. This is some footage of Chris Patton <laughs> and his hairy daughters there. Quite arousing, really. Yeah. Robin Cook is the only minister who is actually happy to be sent naked into the debating chamber. Mm. <laughs> hey. Now, about Tony Blair, he's told Robin Cook's lover, or mistress, or whatever she is, that she can't accompany him on his official tours, which, which is a nightmare for her. Not that she wanted the free trips, it's just you've got to keep your eye on him, know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is this debate about whether, you know, what people do in private affects yeah. how they behave in public. Robin Cook, last week, was uh, seeing a Brazilian trade delegation at the same time as he was seeing a Korean trade delegation. <laughs> He's also seen a Moroccan boy, but that's another story, so... <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to go out. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's all a little secret. No, just in his dreams he was seeing a Moroccan oh, boy. Yes, so yes, yes. Oh, my God, it's the Moroccan boy dream again. Nice to know you are. Nice to know you are. <laughs> well, I think you and you have got very valid points, but... Um, are you a Liberal Democrat? I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to show you, actually, is some very damning pictures from this 70s video, which I found on the top shelf of a special shop. Well, a friend of mine found it at the top of a special shop. Uh, now, this shows that Robin Cook has really got a pass. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's from a film called Cook, the Thief, His Wife and the Three Hot Swedish Babes. <laughs> He's a very serious politician. I will defend him. For example, within three days of entering the Foreign Office, he brought out this mission statement. I don't know if you can, you can see that. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that, that's this year's Cook Girls. Yep. Isn't it? Um, if you look inside, though, it is yeah. fascinating, because it's, it's just a whole list of chat-up lines, really? basically. <laughs> um, for example, if I said you had an appalling human rights record, would you hold it against me? <laughs> Fancy coming back to my place for some tit for tat expulsions. <laughs> Let's see. Let's have a look. Have a look. Um, what's this one? Sort of... My his bollars are fit to explode. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my favourite is uh, Would you like my little spy to come in from the cold? <laughs> <laughs> you see, William Hague this week, who was trying to say, portray himself as the family man. And uh, he'd said that he'd uh, thrashed out uh, an agreement with his wife, which is a scandal in itself, um, <laughs> saying that he would actually see her one night a week and one weekend in four. That's what he actually said, which begs the question, what's he up to the rest of the time, <laughs> given he's got nothing to do for the next five years? <laughs> and uh, talking of uh, William Haig, seven days ago, we launched our Haig countdown clock in Trafalgar Square, 
showing him with just 432 days left until he got deposed. Now, this week saw a breakthrough because the Tories voted to allow all their members to have a say on who was their leader. So, for some reason, Haig's time left in office in the last week has actually gone down to 102 <laughs> days. Uh, there's the new total above our William Haig fameometer, uh, which gives an accurate reading of how famous William Haig is this week. There's Mr Bean. Uh, still at the top, is the most famous thing in the world. Uh, other famous people this week are some cells that might be used to clone a human being, uh, supplied by Robin Cook, hence the ginger. Uh, this is a Chinese woman swimmer here, uh, denying that she takes body-enhancing drugs. Uh, Bill Clinton's penis, uh, which will be required to show in a sexual harassment case, although there is a suggestion he might get round this by actually shredding the evidence. <laughs> so let's just feed in the results, and the results this week show that William Haig is less famous than some cells, a penis, and a rugby player's ear. <laughs> Still, all to play for. Well, there was a slight technical hitch at the Millennium Dome uh, this week when Stephen Bailey, its creative director, the man responsible for everything that's going to be in it, legged it. <laughs> and he didn't, he just, he just got out of a prefabricated hut on the building site and <laughs> took off on a high-speed crane chase. <laughs> At the moment, there's a committee sitting, coming up with ideas on how to spend £750 million on a big, vague thing about time. <laughs> but has anyone actually asked the man in the street what she wants to see in the dome? Well, we did. What would you like to see in the Millennium Dome? Uh, personally, I think I'd like to see a big, vague experience. <laughs> Something complicated about time? <laughs> well, not too fussed, as long as it costs £750 million. <laughs> But I'd like to see a mix between Disneyland and Christianity. Well, I think a public hanging would make me go. Um, a public execution, definitely. Who would you like to see hung? Oh, uh, Peter Mandelson. Peter Mandelson. Peter Mandelson. Oh, I'd like to see Peter Mandelson under it, I think. That would be a very, very great help to the country. Please welcome the former creative director of the Millennium Dome and the most relieved man in Britain, Stephen Bailey. Yay. Hello. Have you had a, a busy week? Yeah, my, my recommendation to workaholics is resign, then you get really, really busy. Oh, really? I haven't, I haven't right, well, I'm off now, then. <laughs> 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 okay, so would you go and see Peter Man Mandelson hung, hanged? Hanged. 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 Well, that would be a sort of cruel and unusual punishment. You're not but saying you would. Perhaps not an inappropriate. <laughs> You're not one. saying you would. I wouldn't say no. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, what the hell is going on in there? <laughs> It's a brilliant <laughs> project. I yes, it really, really is. And if they listen to just a tenth of the ideas mm. I've given them, it'll be yes. a huge success. Why did you say you once that uh, it would be a good idea to have nothing in the dome? That's, you know, I'm uh, no stranger to being <laughs> sort of partially misquoted, or uh -huh. indeed yes. totally misquoted. Well, that's, that's, mm. that's, that's part I, of my job, what I, I Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. What I just said, and mean, was the building alone is so bloody good mm. that it alone justifies the effort. I said you could leave it empty so, and it would yeah. still be fantastic. So, can we just ask, <laughs> is he a dictator, Peter Mann? No, no, you see, I was... Misquote? Uh, and another misquote. Not I mean, I, I like dictators. I mean, I spent ten years oh working... Oh, my God! <laughs> Did you design the Nuremberg rally? <laughs> no, 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 wait. I, mean, I spent ten very, very, very happy years working with, Pol with Terence. No, with Terence yeah. Conrad. I believe there are similarities. Yeah. Terence is a very, very good friend of mine. Terence Conrad is a brilliant dictator. I can tell you. Dictators are fine. I mean, yes. what is Terence not good, fine? But pusillanimous yes. bureaucrats and interfering politicians. So not sure what not a good thing. Is Peter Bandelson a bad dictator? <laughs> no, he's is, he, is he Attila the Man? In my <laughs> It, in my experience, not a dictator at all. Really? I mean, right. it's fine to have a clear... I mean, well, look, in the past week, we've had... The past ten days, we've had uh, Jesus, Mickey Mouse and the Japanese. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, they've all come to... Three good ideas. Nothing. It's the argument <laughs> of the creative people and the bureaucrats. Yes. I passionately believe that a big project like the Millennium Dome, which is should a fantastic have nothing project... In it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but it should be created by creative people uh, with a real vision about what it should be. About. OK, so get people like... Um, Sir Terence Conran, Tony Hart, that sort of person. Paul Hunt. And Peter Mandelson out. All right, then. Well, on that note, thank you very much for coming in. No one leaves the show empty handed, so I'd just like to give you two free tickets to Alton Towers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stephen Bailey. Thank you. Right, with the dome, then, uh, plan A was to have a designer design it, spend a lot of money on some really exciting things, and get people to go. That's not going to happen. <laughs> the designers left. So plan A 
hasn't worked. <laughs> but don't worry, because behind every great plan A is a plan B. <laughs> and on the 31st of December, 1999, we have every confidence that plan B will come into its own. And this is what we can expect it to look like. The Millennium Experience. <laughs> come with us back through the mists of time. Before the birth of the universe. To when there was nothing. <laughs> Before dinosaurs, before minerals, <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> Come with me now into the Cosmos Hall, where we see the creation of space. Vast, infinite, empty, <laughs> void. <laughs> and on now into our life cathedral, well, life itself begins in the blackness of the sea. <laughs> and crawls onto the land at night. <laughs> we move on. Whales turn to men <coughs> who live in caves <coughs> and haven't yet discovered fire. <coughs> we pass now through the dark ages to the Industrial Revolution. Many people are poor, experience in this chamber what it's like to have nothing. <laughs> Children as young as eight are forced to work up chimneys. Chim, chimney, chim, chimney, chim, 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 chim. Or down mines. <laughs> 1939, Europe is at war. People in London live in blackout. <laughs> Meanwhile in Holland, Anne Frank hides in an attic. Then came the 1970s. Fashion became trendy. Step inside our boogie mausoleum and experience for yourself what it's like to go to nightclubs wearing sunglasses. <laughs> And so we reach the present day. In this room, sponsored by Toyota, is an exhibition representing what the Japanese government is paying in compensation to former British prisoners of war. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and so we reach the new millennium and stand at the gateway of an exciting dawn, represented in this, our final room, by a mixture of Christianity and Disney, with a thing about time. <laughs> it's Mickey Mouse on a cross holding a clock. <laughs> Look, the Millennium Dome is going to be bad. <laughs> it's got to be stopped. Now, we could get up a petition, we could start a committee, but on your behalf, we came up with the most effective way to bring construction to a halt, which was to go down to the site at Greenwich and distract the builders. <laughs> First off, we tried the one thing guaranteed to bring a construction site to a halt. A big pot of tea. I've <laughs> <laughs> uh, got a big sun, big copy of the sun, 100 pages long. <laughs> a gigantic copy of their favourite tabloid. Uh, all right. Some tea. Hey, rub me off that. Unfortunately, they weren't thirsty. Time for something far more radical. Two sexy ladies talking like yeah. a builder's dream. <laughs> we're gagging for it. <laughs> Tell from the look in our eyes. Tell from the look in our eyes, we're gagging we really for want it. it. Yeah. No. Nice erections. <laughs> you got a big estimate? <laughs> I like a man who's ready on time, don't you? <laughs> Partial success. <laughs> I'm gagging for it. You can see it in my eyes, can't you? <laughs> Cheeky, yeah. Oh, door's shutting. They were determined to resist temptation. We had one last irresistible try. We like the idea of getting it on together while you watch. <laughs> Time to send in the chopper. Oh, we're just hovering over the Millennium Dome now. I can see at least three men working really quite hard. So I'll move these leaflets along, cash in hand, for work on my home. More money than cents, no need to quote. So this should come to the dome and straight over to my house in North London. <laughs> Come to North London and 
they resist, we'd emptied the site. The Royal Labour have pumped millions into commissioning a report onto what colour of elephant the dome is going to be. <laughs> I think I can guess, actually. <laughs> right, well, we're only just beginning to get the first results of the Queen's specially commissioned focus group uh, looking into ways of modernising the monarchy. From now on, the Queen will be known as Posh Windsor. <laughs> Princess Anne will be Sporty Windsor. <laughs> And Prince Philip will be known as Bastard Windsor. Uh, of course, I'm talking about modernising. The other idea for modernising the monarchy was a new national anthem proposed by Tony Blair. It's more in touch with young people. It's called Smack My Queen Up. <laughs> and here's some footage of her hearing it for the first time. <laughs> I think she likes it. <laughs> right, well, I don't know if anyone saw the photos in the papers of the rugby player Simon Fenn, who had a bit of his ear taken off. Uh, here's a photo there. Uh, which uh, made you wonder how tough the negotiations at the Ulster Peace Talks were this week, uh, when you saw this photo in the Times of Mo Molum. <laughs> people uh, have been going on about the fact that Shin Fe They talk about Sinn Féin and the IRA in the same breath, and they always say that the two things are the same. They're not. They're very separate organisations. Yeah. And it's, it's much like um, people say British Airways or British Airways Freight. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the thing we were wondering was, what, what are the arrangements mm. like at the talks? Because, yeah. yeah, obviously, they're all in a room, they're shouting mm. at each other, but say they want to go to the toilet. Yeah. I mean, do they all have different toilets or something? I mean, at some point, two of them might well want... You know, you might have Jerry Adams and David Trimble, like, at urinals next yeah. to each other, going, yeah. uh, better out than in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these talks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Ulster's a very complicated issue. It's very difficult to get your head around it, of course, and you've got to be uh, sensitive and, and, and fair. Um, so there's really no easy way to explain what's going on, but, hey, you can have a crack at it, eh? And we come up with this. It's our swing mo. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Pull Let, that away. Let's reveal it. Swing mo. <laughs> All the bloods rush to our head. <laughs> <laughs> what are we saying here? Basically, it's a dummy of Mo Molum hanging here by the balls of her feet. <laughs> We're going to use it to demonstrate her negotiating tactics between the two opposing factions here and here. And the fact that she's pivoted here and can swing wildly from one end of the spectrum to the other is just a little clue as to how this remarkable lady pulled it off. <laughs> so let's go back to December and the IRA demand that certain categories of prisoners in the maze should be allowed to visit their families over Christmas or they cannot be held responsible for their actions. Mum Olin comes up with a compromise and says, yes. <laughs> swing mo! <laughs> the loyalists counter with their demand that Mo Molum should visit them in prison over Christmas, or who knows what might happen. <laughs> she balks at this and says, Yes! <laughs> and of course I'll help carry the soil out of your escape tunnels. <laughs> there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Swing Mo! Sinn Féin then demand that in the original framework document they not be referred to as the baddies. <laughs> <laughs> to help make up her mind, they show her a picture of an explosion. Unimpressed by their blackmail, she says, that'll be fine. <laughs> Swing mo! The Ulster Unionists now ask if they can turn up at the peace talks with their faces painted orange. <laughs> mo Molum digs in her heels and says, oh, go on then. And he said to a secretary, and <laughs> called upon her to justify her decision. Swing mo! Sinn Féin think, this is good, and demand that Tony Blair makes a formal apology for those offensive episodes of EastEnders set in Ireland, <laughs> known as the Bloody Sunday Omnibus Edition. 
P.S. They say, bang, 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 remember that. <laughs> Swing, Mo! Now, Mo Molum's approach earns the support of politicians from all sides, including Geoffrey Archer, who says he wants to be Lord Mayor of London or he'll start a bombing campaign. <laughs> Realising that bombing works, the National Viewers and Listeners Association demand an end to violence on television or they'll start a bombing campaign. <laughs> So Mo Molan scraps Biker Grove. <laughs> Robin Cook's wife says she'll start a bombing campaign and good luck to her. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic, think the IRA. Just one last thing. Would you mind letting us have a United Ireland? I love it, say the loyalists. Oh, and you will make sure there's never a United Ireland, won't you? <laughs> and that's how it all got sorted out. <laughs> I just say, while, while we're talking about Northern Ireland, I've got some very interesting footage on that subject in my miniaturised area, which is my security cameras. Now, if you've never seen this before, this is the bit of the show when I go around the world looking at security cameras of the great and the good and the bad and the ugly to see what they've been up to. And I've got one now of Jerry Adams. Now, this is some footage before the security camera of Jerry Adams arriving at Downing Street. Now, we'll cut into the snoop footage here. Now, Jerry Adams shakes Blair's hand, very nervous about meeting Adams for the first time. This is why. <laughs> oh my god, they're gonna kneecap him! <laughs> oh, it's alright, it's a water pistol. <laughs> He's a big practical joker. <laughs> got a big sense of humor. Look, they're all having a big laugh. They're Martin McGuinness. Thinks it's a nice Blair, doesn't think it's very funny at all. Can't, can't take a joke, that man. <laughs> what a miserable kit. <laughs> Martin McGuinness has wet himself. <laughs> Apparently, for weeks afterwards, Blair was finding unattended water bombs and comedy rubber mortar shells around number 10. <laughs> we were talking earlier about ITV's radical new plans to be any good. <laughs> since they rethought their policy of not having a decent sitcom since Rising Damp, the BBC have started to get worried. And, uh, in fact, they've admitted that it might have been a mistake to axe BBC Two's most popular drama ever this life. But they have signed up a very promising, even younger cast for a 26-week season of This Life, The Next Generation. <laughs> God, I'm depressed. <laughs> Take that sherbet. Don't tell me how to live my life. Miles, I'm worried. My play leader says I have to colour this in by the morning. I don't think I can cope. What's wrong with me, Anna? I'm falling apart. <laughs> Hey, Miles, stop telling lies about me behind my back or there'll be trouble, OK? Don't be pathetic! Me, me. I was at a party and I had too much squash and I got drunk and I held O'Donnell's hand. <laughs> meant nothing. How could you? This is the end. But... No buts now. Oh, no! Egg has found out the truth. What's going to happen now? <laughs> We signed up for 15-year contracts, uh, and there's a great episode in 12 years' time where they find a pubic hair in the bath. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> Ferdy's got a new boyfriend, Robin Cook. And, uh, <laughs> shall we see how he does it? Um, <laughs> I've got more of his chat-up lines here. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, I'm Ginger Foreign Secretary. Are you Sporty Personal Secretary? <laughs> Meet scary Wife. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a glass coffee table upstairs. It was a present from the Queen. <laughs> what? Ah, yes. I don't understand that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Let's have a look. Video. Oh, yeah, said in a Leslie Phillips voice. Ooh, Hong Kong. <laughs> oh, this one. Uh, oh, spunky spunk. country. <laughs> Do you give head of state? <laughs> Uh, oh, how about this one? I don't care if you have got gonorrhea, I've got diplomatic immunity. <laughs> right, now, uh, deep at the heart of the Labour government is a resolute commitment to making things sound good. Uh, that's why Blair talked this week about going the full Monty on the economy. <laughs> uh, even though that actually means he's prepared to get his knob out on a coin. <laughs> But it does sound good. So, uh, get ready next week for John Prescott's vow to get transport leaders to perform a dance to the music of time over rail efficiency. <laughs> also watch out for Gordon Brown's call to expand the European Union. Everybody say, E-U. <laughs>
Now, Labour's commitment to getting things to sound good is at the heart of the big idea, welfare to work. Now, welfare to work is about cutting benefit for the elderly, the disabled and single mothers, and causing consternation to the Queen Mother, Britain's oldest disabled single mum. <laughs> but it does sound good, because it's got two words that begin with the same letter. <laughs> now, by the way, the Social Security Minister, Frank Field, was commissioned to think the unthinkable on welfare reform, and he did think the unthinkable because he came up with his report, Welfare to Wang. <laughs> but it does sound good. So, we can now expect the next few months to see a whole raft of good-sounding policies on tax to treasury, <laughs> popular one, Mandelson to Mortar, <laughs> landmines to Liberia, <laughs> weren't meant to know about that one, <laughs> disabled to Doncaster, <laughs> Harry Harmon's idea, fox hunting to fox hunting, <laughs> we've not really changed that one, <laughs> ashes to ashes, funk to funky, <laughs> We know Major Tom's a junkie. But he did just get away with a caution. Just time for a quick check now on Labour promises. Just to remind you, those were the five pledges that Labour put on these little cards, sent it through our doors, and swore on Claire Short's life that they would keep them. <laughs> so let's see how they've been getting on. OK, now, uh, we're going to ignore this one this week. This one, fast-track punishment for persistent young offenders by halving the time from arrest to sentencing. That's the promise they made. Now, they can't quite keep it, but they can make it. Fast-track caution for persistent young minister's sons <laughs> by halving the time from arrest to going to Oxford. <laughs> One's works now. Also this week, Labour have been trying to fulfil this promise. They've been working very hard, come up with a radical solution, which they think might just work. Cut NHS waiting lists by treating an extra 100,000 patients. They're now going to try cutting NH waiting lists by eating an extra <laughs> 100,000 patients. Think the unthinkable, that's what they say. All right, slight uh, amendment in the last pledge this week. This one says, no rise in income tax rates, cut VAT, etc. Slight change, no rise in... Robin Cook. <laughs> I don't know what they're trying to get up there. Maybe you can. Now, finally, they've been in real trouble this week. They found out that they were £4 million in debt. So, what they've done is they're going to amend this line to join phone... Oh, no, 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 no. And they're going to say to join pay. <laughs> that big number is. <laughs> uh, well, that's all uh, from us for this week. By the way, if any of you watching uh, wrote into Points of View this week worrying about Richard Branson the monkey, can I just assure you that only four monkeys were killed in the... <laughs> <laughs> all right. And, um, sorry about the spelling of mortuary in the item earlier, if you want to read about that one. Just time to tell you that Paula Yates has just discovered who her real, real father is. <laughs> I'm Peter Bainham. Eleven days ago, the leader of the Conservative Party, William Hague, made a touching public promise on talk radio's Kirsty Young show. He pledged that every Sunday and one weekend in four, he would not work in order to spend more time with his young bride, Fionn. Last Sunday...